Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning to you online as well. We're glad you are here. Um, we're just as a, a leadership, just want to say thank you so much for last week. Last week, as part of our Engage initiative, or our, sorry, our Reach initiative, um, you gave one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That is amazing. And that $150,000 goes to buying into, literally, this community and the people in Tyler, Texas, and being able to minister to them, but also reaching out and supporting the next generation of ministers as we have the opportunity now to support interns and, and help them come in and learn and live in ministry instead of just kind of passing through quickly and getting the opportunity to grow. And so thank you so much for buying into that vision as a church. Um, that is amazing. And so over the, the past several years as we've looked to try to engage our neighbor, um, you have given $300,000, $300,000 to engage our neighbor through our REACH initiative. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We are in the week five of this series called Exiles. And the series really comes from this idea that Peter begins with as he writes this letter to the exiles who are scattered throughout um, basically the Roman Empire. They're living in a land that is not their own and trying to follow Jesus. And they keep coming in against very difficult circumstances and really difficult times because not everyone they're around is following Jesus. And that makes it difficult for them. And he keeps reminding them of their identity and who they are. And he says this in chapter 2, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Then he says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The, the hope for Peter is that these followers of Jesus would live lives that were set apart from everyone else, that looked different from everyone else, in a way that made other people desire what they had. In a way that, that looked so different that all they could do is say, there's got to be something that's different with them. And it must be something about their relationship with God. It, it sounds very much like um, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And the city on a hill cannot be hidden. People don't light a lamp and they put it under a bowl and they, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So in the same way, let your deeds shine before all men. That they could see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. That there would be something different. If you follow Jesus, there would be something so different, so radical in your life because of your goodness, that they would see God's goodness living in you. They, they would see God's goodness. And so many times, so many times we look at the world, the one thing we do not see is goodness. And unfortunately, so many times from churches, one of the things the world doesn't see is their goodness. They might see their dishonesty. They might see their cruelty. They might see their judgmental spirit. But what Peter wants these followers of Jesus to, to see or to be seen in them in this world is their goodness so that people would see God's goodness through them. And, and so the hope would be that the followers of Jesus would gather together as a community, as a group of followers who are committed to trying to live like Christ, and they would encourage one another and move one another into more and more likeness of Christ. Right? That we would come together, we would celebrate and worship Jesus, 
transforming us into his likeness, and together there would be strength and community. But Peter understands, for these followers of Jesus, there's a problem. And it, it's totally different now. But back then, not everyone that you were in a relationship was a follower of Jesus. To- totally different than today, right? Totally different than today. But back then, not everyone you were in a relationship followed Jesus. And at times, it made it really difficult for them to look like and act like Jesus. And my guess is it's a problem you can probably relate pretty well to. That not everyone we come in contact with, not everyone in our life, not everyone who lives in our neighborhood, not everyone we work for who works for us, follows Jesus. So how do you and I, as his followers, live in a world where not everyone is moving in the same direction that we are? How do you and I follow Jesus in a world that's not following Jesus? And I want to kind of try to get through a really, really long section, but I want to break it up into some little chunks, hopefully, that you can take with you, because there's three spheres, really, of relationship that Peter addresses. The, The first one is this. It's this authorities and government, all right? The second one is a slave-master relationship. And then the third one is husband and wife. And so he kind of works within these three spheres. Here's how you relate to authority and government when they're not followers of Jesus. Here's how you relate slave and master. Because we we can relate, right? Not everyone who is in leadership positions, not everyone who's in our government, is committed followers of Jesus. And and there are laws at times, there are things that come down from higher authorities that we might not agree with. And so Peter's trying to, here's how you live in this world. Here's how you interact in this world. Here's, Here's what you do as a follower of Jesus in a world where others aren't following Jesus. And then he talks about this master slave relationship. And and I think a lot of times people will read that and say, well, is Peter condoning slavery? No, he's not condoning slavery. But in their context, in their culture, slavery was very common. And many times people found themselves in slavery because they were trying to repay a debt that they owed. And, And so what Peter is telling them is if you are in this relationship, not saying it's a great relationship, but if you are in this relationship, there's a way that you should live. And then he talks to husbands and wives. And he he says first to the wives, like if your husband's not following Jesus, there's a way that you should live that honors Christ for the good of your husband. And so he really works through these spheres of relationship. And, And here's the thing, is I'm sure for some of you, these don't really relate to you. I think the first one probably relates to all of us. But the slave master relationship, man, we... That doesn't really relate to us now. Um, the husband and wife, maybe, maybe your husband or wife doesn't follow Jesus, and, and maybe that does really relate to you. But for, for a large part of us, we could say, well, that's kind of back then. What about now? Back when I was in, in college, I had to take an art history course. And um, let, me, let me tell you, there is nothing worse in, in college than art and music appreciation. I had both of them. M- music appreciation, let me just tell you real quick. Music appreciation, 8 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you would walk in, the teacher would turn off the lights and turn on music. And like all you would do, she would play, or he would play composers, and you would just listen to them. I challenge you not to go to sleep in that class. <laughs> challenge you not to go to sleep in that class. And art was the same way. They would turn it off and they would just click through. He had two projectors, one on each side, and he would just click through. This is Picasso. This is Rembrandt. This is... Oh my goodness. It was horrible. But but one of the things I learned, okay, I, I did learn something, is there are some principles of art that determine the quality of the art. There's balance, there's scale, there's contrast, pattern, movement, rhythm, emphasis, unity. 
And how those principles work together determines the quality of that art. And so what I want to do, I want to kind of go through some principles of relationship real quickly that I think Peter gives these followers of Jesus that whether those specific scenarios relate to you or not, they can be carried over into every single relationship that we have. And that they do relate and connect with us where we are in our world today. Sound good? Sure. Okay. All right. I was hoping for some feedback there. All right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, 1 Peter 2, chapter, or verse 13. It says this. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and commend these who do right. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Um, next, um, slaves and masters, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to the, those who are, who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And then in that last context, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So there's a word that occurs in all three of those spheres that you see time and time again in this context. And the word is submit. He says, submit to the government and ruling authorities. He says, slaves, submit to your masters. Wives, submit to your husbands. Okay. He, he uses this word submit, and it's a word that I think in our culture today scares us. Um, it's the word hupotasso in Greek, and it means to be subject or subordinate to someone. And so if we were to kind of translate it into our modern culture, submission is simply this. It is the act, the action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Right? And, and here's, here's honestly the problem we have with submission, right? Is we like to be in control, right? So um, my daughter is learning to drive my oldest daughter right now. I don't even know where she's sitting, so that's great. Um, she's learning to drive right now. She's 15. And every time we get in the car, she wants to drive. And Friday, Thursday, I'm sorry, she wanted to drive everyone to school. We do this little loop and drop off at three different schools. She's wanting to drive. And I said, no, 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 not today, not today. Um, you can drive tomorrow, Friday, okay? And so Friday comes, and she's driving, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat like, oh, man. And, and she's a really good driver. I will, I will say that. Um, her mom has done great um, working with her more than I have. Um, but she liked, and so we had just dropped off Caleb and Kaylee. We dropped off Ryan at Hubbard, and we were going to go around to Legacy, and she was going to um, get out there. And I said, Gracie, let me just tell you, babe, you're a really good driver but I'm a control freak. <laughs> and I really like to drive and be in charge. And there, there's that point. And, and so you can laugh and say, well, that's, that's just you. But let's just be honest. Every single person on some level is a control freak. In fact, I thought we could just do this this morning because it would be really good for your soul. Turn to the person next to you and say, I like to have control. <laughs> now, now, here's the great news for you, okay? Here, here is the really good news. The person you just told that to didn't need to hear that <laughs> because they already know it. They know that about you. They know that you like to have control and be in control. 
But it's a confession that I think all of us need to say from time to time is, I like to have control. And the problem with submission is on some level, it's saying, here, I'm going to surrender my control. I'm going to give up my control. I'm going to surrender my control. And if we're honest, it's not a real comfortable place to be. We don't like to surrender control. But, but he says something really interesting as he's talking through this relationship, specifically with governors and authority. He says this in verse 16. He's just told them, live in submission. And then he says, live as free people. Right? Submit yourself to governing authorities. And then just in the very next breath, I want you to live as free people. Which seems in, in me to kind of contradict itself. How do you live as a free person yet in submission to someone else? He says, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. So you're submitting to a person or seat of authority not because of them, but because you have submitted your life to Jesus. Because you have submitted your life to Jesus. Because you live as a free person in Christ. Now submit yourself to another person. Right, and that's that, that first principle. is submission. Like in, in our relationships, that we would submit. And it's one of those things, like, for me, it's really difficult to, to grasp. And, and it really, how do you live as a free person and yet in submission? And I started to wonder is it possible there are certain things that no one can take from you? Are, are there things that are so deep within your soul that no matter what? authorities or rulers or laws would say that they cannot be stripped away? Are there things that we hold so dearly that are more than just our physical freedom, that are bigger than ourselves? Because there are going to be times that you find yourself in a relationship with other people who are not following Jesus. Maybe it's a coach, a boss, a neighbor, an employee. Maybe it is a government official. Maybe it is a spouse. But how do we relate to them? How do we live in that context? And so I want to talk for just a second about what submission is not. Specifically Christian in the context of followers of Jesus, what submission is not. Okay, first of all, it's not turning off our mind. Right? It doesn't mean I'm just going to turn off my mind, I'm going to do whatever. Um, you tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. All right? It's not just turning off your mind. It's not avoiding right, the effort to influence. The whole purpose in these relationships and I think you see through, through Peter, he's very concerned with the witness that these people have of Jesus. That people would see Christ in and through their lives. And so it's not going into this relationship, I'm just doing everything mindlessly. No, no, there is a purpose in your submission. And it's influence. Right? Third, it's not prioritizing the will of the leader over the will of God. Right? There, there are certain things that we're not going to do. We're not going to go there. Okay? Fourth, allowing the relationship to be the source of our identity. Right? 
It is a relationship. There's a purpose in it. But it is not our identity. And five is acting in fear. We're not going to act in fear. And I think one of the best examples I could think of of what it looks like, like just flesh and blood, was Oscar Schindler. He, He was in the Nazi party, and he made a decision. And it's, it's rough because the first, his decision was for his profit and for his business. He was hiding Jews from the, the Nazi concentration camps. But as he got to know the people, and as he got to live life within that context, he realized what was happening was so egregious that he could not be part of it. And because of Oscar Schindler, there are 1,200 Jews that did not die in concentration camps because he put himself on the line, right? He, he didn't just turn off his mind. He didn't avoid the effort to influence. He didn't prioritize the will of the leader above God. He didn't um, allow those relations to be the sort, and he didn't act in fear, And I think that's exactly what it is supposed to look like. Like there are times when people in places of power are going to tell us that we should do things that aren't with the will of God. Where we kind of just have to step back and refrain and say, no, no, I can't be in complete humility and gentleness and respect. But we can't be a part of that. And so then the question, if, if that's what it's not, what is it? Right? Submit means it is the divine, right? Go to that divine calling of a Christian to honor and affirm those in a place of leadership. Right? To honor and affirm those in a place of leadership. Because Ultimately, we're submitting to the will of God in our submission to those people in authority. And we're going to honor and affirm their position and their place as followers of Jesus. And and you might not agree with everything they do, but if it's not against the will of God the Father, then we're going to fall in line. That gets kind of difficult. It, it's difficult when we disagree to submit. It's difficult in this world to be a follower of Jesus. But there was a purpose for that submission. Right? Paul does, or excuse me, Peter. Peter does not say, I want you to submit just for the sake of submitting. There there was another purpose in it, and it was transformation. Transformation was the purpose. Because the hope is that as you are following Jesus, you are being transformed more and more and more into His likeness, that you look more and more like Jesus in your relationships so that they might see you and see the goodness of God. And then the hope would be, as they see God's goodness evident through your life and in this world, they would begin to fall in love with Him. That was always the purpose. It was never about, we just want you to submit for the sake of submission. Peter's telling this church, to these churches, to these exiles who are scattered, I want you to submit because through your submission, they will see the goodness of God. Here's what he says in in verse 15 in chapter 2. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence their arrogant, the arrogant talk of the foolish people. And going, going on to the, the wives. Wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husbands 
so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. It was always for the purpose of transformation. I'm going to put you in these relationships. Now, now remember, this is a letter written to these churches and to these people who are following Jesus in a world that's struggling to follow Jesus. And it makes it really difficult on them as followers of Jesus. But it is a letter, and there are not, Peter's not writing this with verses and subheadings. He is writing this flow of thought. Right? And you go back, he says that Jesus is this living stone. In fact, he's the cornerstone. Remember, remember the stones? Right? And if we don't begin there with him as the foundation, everything else falls apart. Right? He's not just some other stone that has a place. He is the cornerstone. He is the beginning. He is the rock of that foundation. And if we don't begin there, then everything else falls apart. But then he says, and you, like that, are becoming these living stones. So like Jesus is this living stone, you are being transformed into this living stone as well. That, that your life is going to begin to matter and look more and more like the stone, the rock that is Christ. And this rock that is Christ was rejected by men, but he was loved by God. He was chosen by him. And so as we're transformed, right, that's where we began this morning. As we're transformed, the hope is that people would see your good goodness and praise God for it. That they would see how your life is different. And then specifically in the context of these three spheres of relationship. Right? That, that you have these relationships for a purpose. You are a set apart people for a purpose. You are here for a purpose. You are in the relationship you are in with your neighbor for a purpose. You are in the relationship you are as a boss or an employee for a purpose. As a coach, as an athlete, as a teacher, as a student, you are in this relationship for a purpose, and that purpose is transformation. As they begin to see God's goodness through your life, that they would fall more and more in love with Jesus. As they saw God at work in your lives. And then the third principle, real quick, is identity. Over and over and over through this letter, Peter continues to point these people back to Jesus. And anchors their identity in him so he, he talks about here's how you relate to government authorities here's how you relate slave and master here's husband and wives and these non-christian relationships but i think they spill over into all relationships and he points back to this identity that we have in christ he says this to, to this you were called. Right? This, this idea of submission and living life under the authority of someone else. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in His mouth. When they hurled their insults at Him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins 
and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Your identity is rooted in Christ. And the reason that you have the relationships you have in this world is so that people would see the goodness of Christ in your life. Now just another moment of confession. If I'm honest, I don't always think of my relationships in that way. I I don't always think of the relationships that I have with people as this is the hope of this relationship is they would see the goodness of God living in my life. See, because this this is where it makes a lot of sense to me. Because if I'm following Jesus, it's a lot easier to do it with a lot of people who are doing it with me. Right? If we could just go out and live our life all the time together, being a follower of Jesus would be a lot easier. If I got to work with, with you people all the time, and I kind of do, so. Um. <laughs> but if you were me, right? No, no. If we got to live our life together all of the time, this would be so much easier. And, and like I said, for me, it makes sense that that's how it should be. But I think Peter sees something beautiful. Do you remember how he starts the letter? To you, exiles. To God's elect, scattered throughout these provinces. A scattered church, to me, doesn't seem like a strong church. Right? The scattered stones don't seem like a strong foundation. But I think Peter would say, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. That is the beauty of this kingdom. That each of you, these scattered stones who are trying to reflect God's goodness in this world, have influence in a number of different spheres. Because there are people who follow Jesus who live in this neighborhood, and who live in that neighborhood, and who live in that neighborhood, and 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 they live in that apartment complex, and that apartment complex, and that apartment complex, and there are all these people that are reflecting Christ's light in this world. And there are all these people in all these different schools who are reflecting Christ's light. And there are all these people who are going to grocery stores or restaurants right after we get done, and they're going to reflect Christ's light. See, the beauty of the kingdom of God is not that we would come into a room and gather and worship and then go like nothing else is different in our life. It's that we would come in here and we'd be transformed by the love of Christ and encouraged by one another and go out and be a light in this world. That is the hope of the kingdom of God. And that was always Jesus' plan. This wasn't the fallback just in case it didn't work. It was I'm going to empower the body of Christ through my spirit to go and represent me to this world. To be this holy set apart people, this holy nation, this congregation of priests who would reflect me to a world that doesn't know me. See, here's the beauty. Is the person that you come in contact every single day who does not know Jesus, the only way 
they may see Jesus is through your life. You get to be Jesus in this world. That is what He's called you to. To reflect Him. And so here, here's my question this morning for you. What is the reflection they see? When they look at you, when they look at me, what is it that they see? Because you were set apart for a purpose. So that people would see the goodness of God in your life. That's why engage our neighbor is so incredibly important. Because the only time they may ever see Jesus is through our lives. Father, today we thank You so much for Jesus. We thank You so much that we find our identity in a Savior who sacrificed and surrendered His life, who submitted His life ultimately to Your will. And Father, may our lives reflect Jesus more and more today with the hope that the places that You put us all around this city would see the goodness of God through our lives and begin to fall in love with Jesus. Father, we thank You. We celebrate Jesus. And we pray in His name. Amen. Hey, as we conclude this morning, we're going to have our shepherds and their spouses around the back of the auditorium. If we could help you as you walk with Jesus, if you've never surrendered your life to Him and submitted to Him in the first place, man, what a great day to do that. They would love to talk with you or help you in any way that they can as we stand and sing.